Hello, we're here at Netreo's user group get together with Steve White, founder and CEO of Viking Technology Advisors. Steve, it's great to have this fireside chat with you. Nice to be here, Jasmine. Thank you for the invitation. Steve, we have known each other for a few years. You were a customer of Netreo. Can you tell us a little bit more about your background so that we can get a little context around what you do? Sure, I'd love to. So um, my name is uh, Steve White, obviously. Um, I've got over 25 years of industry experience in financial services, 14 years of running global network infrastructure for State Street Corporation, and most recently, six years at Citizens Bank, where I helped them through a major insourcing program, helped build a transformational team that enabled that's enabling their cloud journey. You know, the most exciting part of my career was the early parts of my career where I worked for a company called International Network Services, which was Cisco's premier integration partner in the late 90s. And I also worked for another startup professional services firm after that. And during my time in professional services, it provided me an opportunity to learn about different companies, help solve different problems at different companies. And that's really the thing that, that it really excites me about the technology industry. So I've started Viking Technology Advisors to take the 25 years of knowledge and experience that I have and share that more broadly uh, you know, with the industry and help other executives that may be going through a transformation and everyone's going through a transformation. And I'm, I'm gonna stop short, Jazz, of, of calling it cloud because there are more transformation efforts other than just cloud um, that we can actually help advise companies to be successful. And, and a lot of that is through data-driven analytics. And I'm, I'll be excited to talk more about that with you as we, as we progress through our discussion here. That's fantastic. Thank you for sharing the wealth of your experience here with us as well. What is the overview of, say, a bank's network infrastructure and its role in supporting operations and services? The network is the fabric and the enabling component for every piece of the business as it's delivered. It's, it's through enabling through third-party interconnections, enablement for applications and systems, enablement for customers, enablement for employees, um, and all of the different associated access. As you can imagine, you know, being at State Street for 14 years and there as a custodial bank, my transition into a consumer banking industry was very different, right? The number of branch locations, the size of the customer base, and the risk and regulatory compliance, believe it or not, are different. Although, you know, at State Street, we had global regulatory and risk that we needed to manage. And at Citizens, it was all about managing, um, you know, uh, U.S. banking laws and regulatory and regulations. Um, all of those very, uh, you know, interconnected. And the management of those environments requires a lot of detailed hygiene to make sure that you can be successful and you can demonstrate the successful control environment supporting the customer base. That's fantastic. So talking about management, how did you come across Netrio and what was your experience like with us? Netrio was actually a company that when I first joined um, Citizens, my previous company, uh, we were building a, a networked in-source function, and I was looking for a partner to help us with that insourcing. Um, and Netrio was the technology that we selected to help us with our operational management of the network infrastructure, including inventory management, configuration, compliance, um, and incident problem and change management um, integrated with um, ServiceNow. So the NetTrio tool was something that we brought in as a partnership with AT&T. Mm -hmm. um, and that we that partnership has been in place for a better part of four, over four years now. I think we had recently signed a, a contract extension for, for another, uh, another year, I believe. Thank you. So wonderful relationship we've had in the past couple of years working together. So really appreciate your time today in terms of getting that broader industry view of what financial institutions are looking for as well. You mentioned security and compliance. So how does the bank ensure the security and compliance of its network infrastructure, especially in the context of financial regulations? What are some of the common sort of cybersecurity threats and challenges faced maybe by financial institutions and how does the bank address them? But so in, in the banking industry, they use they use concepts of first line, second line and third line of defense. So there's there's a very strong governance and control landscape. And then across the governance and control landscape, 
the reporting that's associated with that, which shows sustainability of the controls, meaning that dem you can demonstrate that firewall policies are being managed and administered as designed. Network configurations and network devices are being patched on a regular basis. Um, maintaining all of that in compliance with best practices defined by the CISO's office, Chief Information Security Office, connects the dot, which I always call the CISO's office is really the fourth line of defense because they're the ones that provide the guidance and the policy. And the criticality of the network, there's so much change that happens in the network on a regular basis that the compliance and reporting components are super important to ensure that there are no mistakes made. Um, and then the, the, the office of the CISO's office, they maintain detailed reporting and, and oversight uh, of the functions of the environment, which is also another um, check and balance to make sure that everything is working as designed. That makes a lot of sense. When you think of check and balance and ensuring that everything's constantly working, could you discuss some strategies and best practices in place to ensure network resilience and disaster recovery preparedness, particularly in the event of unexpected outages or cyber attacks? So there's a, there's a few things to think about here. So obviously, the network elements are typically things that are established over years at, at any firm. And within that, there, there needs to be a detailed focus on, or there is a detailed focus on, design, you know, design in the environment with no single points of failure and the ability to withstand multiple simultaneous failures, right? So if you think about if you've got two circuits interconnecting the data center, one of those two circuits fails, now you're down to one, if you have another failure, you lose all that connectivity. So the way we would design um, environments is we'd have four circuits. So we would be able to withstand at least three simultaneous failures. Um, and then that also provides additional capacity uh, from a capacity planning perspective. Also, you know, one of the other key things is, is the applications and databases must be designed to be able to, to support these various fail failover scenarios. In some cases, they can't because the databases either need to fail over at the same time because can't run the app tier based upon the latency between a particular data center. So these are all important considerations um, that, that need to be part of the solution design to ensure that it meets the criteria um, of the business. The other thing we do, too, is, is we, do, we do what's called uh, tabletop exercises where we run test scenarios. We also run test scenarios for cybersecurity attacks so that we can test the, our ability to be ready. And what that also does, it helps us identify gaps in our current processes that, that, can, that can be closed so that at the time of a real event, that we can move methodically through the event and move through it quickly to restore service. Um, cloud architectures is also a really important element that's that to your resiliency and redundancy. Um, and hosting applications in the cloud, as well as having dependencies on your backend data centers are also important considerations for resiliency. So you really need to think through, um, you know, where the group of applications is going to run, where their interdependencies are. And that's actually one of the, one of the um, foundational elements of my new company that we're working on is developing um, some software capabilities that will bring full transparency to the application dependency maps, to the infrastructure, and, 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 and align and provide the ability to make strategic decisions on how to either move applications or make sure the environment is designed to support the need. That makes a lot the of sense. The other component, I just want to offer one more thing too, Jazz, is in, in, the, in cybersecurity, probably one of the biggest risks that face um, financial services is in the area of denial of service attacks, DDoS attacks. Yeah. With DDoX attacks, in the typical delivery models that we're all kind of used to, where there's VPN head ends and everybody kind of connects to that VPN head end, and, and it's usually shared with um, you know, hosted application services, which are really the attack vectors that, that attackers, attackers use, by, by distributing that to cloud services using, for example, Secure Access Service Edge, um, that distributes your your threat uh, landscape now because now your you, you know your colleagues don't have to rely on your head end in, internet to gain access to critical applications for example that so it really sense. really has a holistic approach that needs to be thought about 
That's really important. When you think of that holistic approach and the different things that network engineers have to go through, what are some of the other integration challenges when you think of security, cloud, and a few of these other major network components, right, that uh, your teams typically need to pay attention to? Maintaining a, a very good working relationship with your cloud platform teams, with your infrastructure teams, and your cybersecurity teams, mm -hmm. and having the roadmaps and the strategies aligned and the priorities is critically important. Um, be, because as you, depending upon what you, where you are on your journey, and, and it, 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 having an aligned delivery approach will ensure the successful outcome. It's also important too for engagement of the colleagues at different levels within the team, right? And having them participating in the direction and the strategy as well as the delivery. And, and that can be hard to do because you're still running an environment and you're trying to transform an environment at the same time. So it's a really, really challenging thing to do. Um, but that's where having efficiency gains in your current on-state and on-prem environment through automation um, and efficiency gains through risk and regulatory can actually provide more efficiencies to the organization because those risk and regulatory controls are super important uh, and they need to be managed effectively and, and they can be extremely time uh, consuming as well. Love it. You talked a lot about risk and security and compliance, which are major topics that we need to ensure that financial institutions are con continually complying with. I think we're also talking a lot these days about digital transformation and some of these new innovations around digital banking. How does the bank or financial institutions, how should they be planning for network scalability to accommodate growth in digital banking services and consumer demands? That that is a great question, uh, Jazz. And in in the really the best approach for that, it really is the cloud, right? Because the cloud provides that level of scalability and elasticity to be able to grow on demand and allows you to be able to deliver that in a distributed model, right? If your bank is on the West Coast, for example, you don't actually have to have everybody hairpinning back to the West Coast to access those workloads, right? You can you can distribute that. Um, you know, across ac across the environment. So I think you know the 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 challenge is is that is how do you get there, right? And, and what are the steps in that process to get there? And and how do you do that in a responsible way? Um, and do you do that using cloud native capabilities, or do you do that using you know traditional capabilities? And obviously, cloud native is the most um, the most interesting approach and probably the most scalable in the long term. Um, the challenge right now is, is is getting from from where they are today to where they're going in the future, and I, I think um, that that that's uh, that's a, an interesting problem to solve. I'm not sure I can solve it here, but I can certainly speak to it. That's true. So you now have a number of different challenges that the bank's facing from a regulatory side, compliance, customers and consumers asking for a different level of experience, lots of new, you know, evolving sort of technologies out there as well. So it sounds like as you look at the different sort of vendor landscape, it feels important to know what's happening out there in terms of the different tools and emerging technologies available. So can you share some insights into how the bank chooses um, its network infrastructure vendors and how you know, you would you typically manage partnerships in the context of financial sector specific needs? Sure, happy to. The, the vendor partnerships are strategically important to, to the success of any um, IT organization. Um, you know, a good partnership equals success in my mind. So having regular meetings with, uh, you know, with your incumbent vendors, having a deep, you know, allowing them to have a detailed understanding or sharing with them a detailed understanding of what your goals and aspirations are at leveraging their advanced services capabilities wherever possible and collaborating with them on your strategy is, is also important because what that, you know, most of these companies that you, that all of us are partnering with, and we're probably all using the same ones. They are, think about it. They are in every, every financial services company, um, and a lot of us, although we all think we're super special, are dealing with the same problems. So, you know, joining, um, you know, joining user group forums and being part of 
Um, financial services forums where you can do knowledge share and developing relationships is as equally as important as having strong relationships with your incumbent vendors and learning from them and taking the time to work with them so that if something does go wrong um, and you do need to reach out to them, they'll be very responsive to you and they'll, and they'll, be, they'll be willing to and, and very interested in helping you. I think it's also equally important is take the time to get to know account teams from companies that you don't do business with. Take the time to develop relationships with new vendors um, and don't be afraid to share with them what you're, what you're thinking about, what your challenges are. Having those relationships with those new vendors will actually create an opportunity for you to learn more about what's happening in the industry. But what it'll also allow you to do maybe is perhaps maybe you'll end up onboarding a new partner. Um, and and that, that is important. Again, you can, we can't do this on our own. In my past experience of being in professional services and then going from a consulting background and into the enterprise for the past 25 years, I've leveraged that approach to significant success by always partnering and being available and communicating. You know, people would send me emails and sometimes we don't respond. And, and I've, as I've shared with others, it's not that we don't want to, it's just we don't have any time. <laughs> you know, we'd have to we'd have to send those emails at 10 o'clock at night. But, you know, generally speaking, if you can make the time to do it, I think it would be really helpful to your overall success. Thank you. That's really good advice, I think, for all vendors out there and partners to develop you know, strong relationships. So let's talk a little bit about emerging technologies as we look at the vendor landscape and the cool things that customers and partners are looking for uh, today, what emerging technologies such as SD-WAN, edge computing, or AI-driven network analytics are being explored to, to improve network performance and security? Obviously, SD-WAN and the, and the secure access service edge are probably the two biggest technology value-added capabilities that, that, are, that are available to the enterprise today, providing a direct access experience to cloud-hosted applications moving away from hairpinning traffic through hub data centers to gain access to those cloud providers. Um, that, that is really, really game changing. And then what it, what it also does is it drives significant cost savings, right? Because traditional MPLS circuit costs and traditional network costs are super expensive. You can drive significant cost savings by adopting an SD-WAN based solution and moving to a broadband based access model and the resiliency of those business class internet services, in my opinion, is as good, if not better, than what you can get with an MPLS service. And the performance is a significant improvement at a much lower price point. Um, you know, there's a there's a myriad of products out there and capabilities when it comes to a secure access service edge. And some terms you'll hear in the industry is like zero trust network access, where you're moving away from VPN. Um, there's a new company that I'm going to be uh, that I've been working with. I've had a lot of success with is uh, Netscope. So we've deployed um, Netscope very successfully, and, and it's been a game changer for us because what it's allowed us to do. Can you imagine not having to VPN or or to use a key fob to actually connect to your, you know, to your Office 365 or your OneDrive? Most of us are knowledge workers, and we don't need to gain direct access back to head ends, and a lot of that head-end access is really driven by the need for application support and infrastructure support, not necessarily um, VPN. So those are really cool technologies. And, you know, the other technology I, I think is, you know, it's obviously NetTrio has a very unique set of capabilities and management and monitoring um, and configuration management and, and operational management of an infrastructure. Um, and, you know, I'd like to also throw out another idea for another company that I've been that I've been watching and, and participating in some planning with is a company called Glueware, which is intelligent network automation. And that intelligent network automation actually brings a layer of abstraction and, and improved efficiencies for automating of network infrastructures, which is really, really important because the network teams right now are drowning under the weight of trying to manage environments with multi, multi vendors and trying to maintain compliance, risk and compliance as we talked about. Um, so those are, those are the ones that I've been the most excited about. Um, and then obviously we've got a little something going on with this application dependency mapping thing that I'm working on with a partner of mine, but I'm, you know, we're, we're excited about that. Um, 
And then, you know, one other area to think about, too, you can't have a conversation like this without talking about AI, right? So, um, you know, anal AI driven analytics in, you know, what Netrio is planning on doing with AI analytics, I think is really super exciting. I think the opportunity for that with all the different data sets that companies have, if a company, if you think about it, every company has you know, like if you're an Illumio customer, you've got the Illumio database and all the information is associated with that on the application dependency side. If you're a Cisco customer, you've got that with Tetration. If you're you know, a VMware customer, you've got that with vRealize. But being able to take that information, a lot of times the challenge is, is extracting that and making it useful for yourself. Mm -hmm. But that's really the power and the excitement about AI is, is that AI can make that as simple as this conversation to be able to extract information and use that to help make decisions on what your journey is going to be and how you may want to get there, uh, the success of your journey, risks that might be associated with that at any point in time. But imagine the power of that for your operations teams when something's broken down or not working. And not only that, but what I think is pretty, probably pretty cool in the, in the forefront of that or in the future of this, not long out, is going to be as predictive and predictive analytics. Predictive analytics is going to be super exciting because now you imagine being able to predict when something's going to happen based upon a particular trend that you're seeing, which is also going to dramatically improve your cybersecurity um, elements by, by you know through that through those predictive analytics capabilities. So there's a lot of really exciting stuff out there, and um, I'm I'm pretty passionate about it, as you can tell. That's fantastic. Thank you for sharing all these cool innovations that really make a difference, right? Because there's sometimes so much out there, it's hard to really figure out what would move the needle. So how would you suggest, you know, network engineers keep up with all this? How do they upskill? That is a really great question. First and foremost is being a network engineer or being a technologist is, is really not a nine to five job, right? It's got to be something that you're excited about. Um, and it's something that you do on your own time, right? I do a lot of reading in my own time. I'm always interested in finding new ways to discover things. But I also think what's, what's, what one of the key things that I would recommend or a couple of key points would be, one is take, take the time to understand how the technology actually works, right? Because the concepts and the capabilities, having that detailed knowledge and understanding is extended into the cloud, but it's extended into the cloud, but it still functions the same way, right? I mean, protocols and communication protocols function the same way in the cloud as they do on-prem, right? BGP and OSPF functions the same. Um, it's The execution is a little bit different, but that's not really the complexity. It's not the complexity of execution. It's the complexity of understanding how it actually works. So maintaining a detailed understanding of how these technologies work, and then also remembering that in the network space, we touch everything, right? And I consider myself a network professional. We touch everything, routers, switches, firewalls, load balancers, cybersecurity components, everything that touches the network is something that a network administrator needs to have some awareness of and knowledge of how, about how that works. Once you are able to master that, then you can actually perform and engineer solutions that really are encompassing end to end. And then that gives you a unique capability and it, and it gives you a unique brand of being able to be extensible across any part of the infrastructure. Mm -hmm. I know and it's a pretty lofty goal, but I, I but I, I think it's, you know, you, you, you really need to start somewhere. And I think that that, that would be an important element to, to, uh, to go after. So understanding technology pieces, not just the networking piece, but also the hardware around it and different protocols and best practices, that's really something that they should be doing. Are there any sort of certifications they should be focused on as well? C certifications, I think certifications, vendor specific certifications, I think are important to have and maintain. But but again, those vendor specific certifications are how those standard based solutions are deployed in their environments. Again, you get more out of that having a detailed understanding about how those standard based solutions function. Mm -hmm. um so that you know that that's that's really that's really important and i i think the you know industry based certifications are also equally exciting and and probably more so important because they're they have extensibility across different vendor products right so like a you know a cissp certification for security 
This is extremely important certification. Have. And by the way, in a network world, you need to have a, a very detailed focus on cybersecurity. And you really need to have an understanding and a knowledge of how firewalls function, how they work, how application protocols function, how, how applications communicate across an infrastructure. Um, another area would be is, is it, it may be Scrum Master is probably might be a little bit too um, uh, lofty of a goal, but having a detailed understanding of agile-based delivery and Scrum-based delivery is a really important element because everything today and all new projects and initiatives are all being done using Agile. And there's a lot of improvements to efficiencies that can be gained through that. In the infrastructure space, it's not really agile in some cases because it's it's very much planning. I'm buying this equipment, I'm ordering these circuits, I'm deploying this infrastructure, and it's all based upon a predefined timeline. But that doesn't mean that you can't have some type of a hybrid approach, which we've done successfully, at least I've done successfully in my past, um, is using a hybrid approach for that delivery, which is really, really, really cool as well. That's fantastic. Thank you. Because you're, I think you're constantly bringing in new technology, new ideas. How does that actually transcend or transact into rolling it out? It's super important to have the right foundational environment in place. Your, your, your legacy environment needs to be um, ready for the transformation journey, right? Um, it can become a barrier to success. Um, and the, one of the challenges typically, and I think we all uh, deal with this, is, is you know, the lack of automation in those spaces, the lack of transparency on how those functions. A lot of times there's been a lot of turnover in teams and people don't have visibility or knowledge about how stuff is actually working. There's new technologies that's coming to market, like some of the ones we talked about, that will help bring trans transparency to that. Um, those, are, those are really, really important elements. And then aligning the delivery for both, whether it's a hybrid model, it's a full cloud model. Um, and if it's a full cloud model, you know, what, what, what's that transition period look like? How will the controls and processes evolve during that? Um, and once they're, once, you know, if it's a full hybrid model, then, you know, legacy environment is not that much of a consideration, but it does need to be a consideration because it's probably going to slow you down. But if it's a hybrid model, how are those two things going to work together? Right, and how are you going to extend workloads between your on-prem data center and your cloud? You know, the financial regulations uh, for a potential new customer that I've been talking to is that you know they they they're recommending against having all your workloads running in one cloud provider. They want you to have more diversity to your operating model. This is a this is a financial um, a service provider, and they're planning on an on-prem element to that be, to be able to manage. Uh, failover and resiliency if there was ever a bad day within one of the cloud providers. And having the right architecture in place to support that is criti critically important. And having the people aligned to be able to support it is also critically important. Wow. Thank you for all these amazing like nuggets of insight, right, on the practical aspects of network management and team management. I think some of the interesting insights and key takeaways include really keeping an eye out for new technologies uh, and cool innovations to really help transform the network in a continuous fashion. I'd just like to thank you for the opportunity to participate in this session with you, Jazz. It was it was a very enjoyable discussion. You know, feel free to reach out to me um, and allow me to, you know, provide some, share some of my knowledge and experience. Again, back to my point regarding relationships. Relationships are critically important and is no obligation to buy. So we can have a conversation and it'll be, and we'll have some fun. <laughs> That's fantastic. So once again, thank you so much, Steve White of Viking Technology Advisors. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your day.